I'm Sam Roberts of The New York Times. Welcome to The New York Times Close Up. A remarkable week with questions about loyalty, integrity, our priorities as a nation, and how they began. The Pulitzer Prize-winning historian Stephen Greenblatt's latest work, The Rise and Fall of Adam and Eve, couldn't be more relevant today. His book raises a remarkable question, who wrote the story and why does it continue to have such resonance? He joins us in a moment. My Times colleagues, contributing writers Clyde Haberman, Eleanor Randolph, About New York columnist Jim Dwyer, and City Hall Bureau reporter J. David Goodman discuss the latest developments and the week ahead with the backstory. And I'll offer some final thoughts in CODA. But first, Pulitzer Prize winning Harvard historian Stephen Greenblatt explores the residence of the rise and fall of Adam and Eve, just been published by W.W. W. Norton and Company, reviewed in next Sunday's edition of the New York Times Book Review by Marilyn Robinson, a full review, full page review. And you've been critical at times of the impact of religion on Western culture. Does researching this book make you more or less inclined to believe in God? I would say that I began this book, uh, Sam, by asking myself, how is it possible that so many of our contemporaries, 40%, I think, in polls, profess to believe in the literal truth of a story that is almost literally unbelievable, that is to say, naked man and woman, talking snake, magical trees uh, in a mysterious garden. Uh, in the wake of Darwin, of evolutionary biology, of geology, uh, how is it possible? And it, it was only possible to write my book when I gave up uh, the, um, the, how should we say, sense of superior, uh, superiority and skepticism that, that uh, frames a question of that kind. The story is powerful and important and present, uh, not principally because of human credulity, gullibility, or because of religious dogma, but because it's an immensely powerful story that is very good to think with, even if it uh, is impossible to believe uh, in a literal way in relation to contemporary science. Why has that one story become so universal? Universal is probably too strong, but it's a but it is uh, for Jews and for Muslims and for Christians, and particularly for Christians, it's an absolutely central story, and it I think it has a number of there are doctrinal reasons why it's so important. Uh, there are reasons that are connected to the fact that it's the initial story in the Book of Genesis, but it's also because there's something how shall I say radioactive in the story. There's something immensely powerful at its core. It's only a page and a half or a little more than that in the Bible, and yet it professes in a tiny compass and in a very powerful way to explain just about everything. Does the story put the blame on Eve? The tradition very often put the, the blame on Eve, uh, but the story itself, I think, is much more ambiguous about who's principally to blame. Uh, and indeed, one of the strange things is that the, one of the earliest traces that we have of the story from 2,000 years ago uh, says that Eve must, must be the hero of the story because she actually chose to know the difference between good and evil against a apparently irrational prohibition. That's from 2,000 years ago. Now, one of the things you point out in the book, too, is that there isn't a single creation story in the Bible, right? There, there are two would, uh, that seem to be, well, for a very long time, uh, most people thought that there must be a single story, but with two slight variants. Now, many scholars think that there are two that are are tied together. Chapter 1 of Genesis, which says that God created uh, man in his image, male and female, he created them. And chapter 2 and 3, we're in, we're in a different creation world in which there's a man and he doesn't have a partner and God apparently rethinks what he's done and decides to give him the, uh, the partner, first showing him all the other animals and then uh, giving him the woman. When we look at Darwin, when we look at fossils, how do we square science with this interpretation? With this, is this a myth? Is it an allegory? What is it? I don't think that the goal should be to try to square them. I don't think it's possible to do so. I, I uh, don't think that we should try to imagine that a day in, in biblical time must be an eon in geological time. There are lots of people trying to do this. I think we have to understand this story is coming out of a very, very deep and 
powerful and passionate side of the human imagination to try to explain such uh, experiences as, as love and mortality, uh, fear of snakes, uh, the need to labor, uh, and, and to try to get these into a powerful uh, narrative. And that's what the story does. Did the story change over time? Did it evolve, or have we stuck with that same version? It changed a great deal in the sense that interpretations of the story constantly change. I mean, there are huge arguments right really from the beginning. And the story means something different for Muslims than it means for Christians, and something different for Christians than it means for Jews. But also within each of these traditions, religious traditions, there have been unending arguments because the stakes are incredibly high. Mm -hmm. Who are we? Why, how did we get this way? Uh, and there have been um, competing arguments really virtually from the beginning about who we are focused on this story. The beginning, a good word for Genesis. Yeah. Uh, you say that it was an, in effect burying a hated past, uh, that the Jews created this in a sense after leaving Babylonia. What was wrong with the Babylonian version of creation? I mean, the Jews had uh, as slaves in Babylon, as exiles, a heavy dose of the, of the Babylonian story, which is a rich and complex story having to do with rape and uh, matricide and parricide and, uh, and that fundamentally does not focus on human moral responsibility. It focuses elsewhere. Uh, it focuses on human noise. The, the senior god can't nap in the afternoon. He gets increasingly annoyed uh, at the humans he's created to dig irrigation ditches and work in the garden, but really work in the garden. And he decides it's not worth it to let the junior gods do that work. He'll just destroy these uh, humans. And the, he's made them to do slave labor, in effect. And he, they just make too much noise. The whole notion of violating a prohibition is alien to the uh, Babylonian tradition. That may not be why the Hebrews originally rose up to come up with their own story. They also rose up to come up with their story because they said, look, it's not Marduk or uh, who created the universe, or Apsu, it's, it's our God. Mm -hmm. Well, how were Adam and Eve supposed to know what was good and what was evil if God hadn't taught them that? This is a problem, isn't it? <laughs> and people recognize that it's a problem from the beginning. That's what's so fascinating about it, that, that you have the God who says, don't do this uh, lest you die, but doesn't explain what death is to people who've lived in a, right. in a world without death. And then, he, and then he says, you cannot eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but how can you obey a prohibition if you don't know the difference between good and evil? And from the very beginning, these questions uh, troubled people. That's, in effect, we think that stories should be simple and transparent if they're appropriate myths, but the opposite is the case. The great stories, the great myths, are bones stuck in the throat. We can't swallow them and we can't spit them up. We keep struggling with them. You wrote an op-ed piece in the Times uh, last fall, I think just before the election, about uh, Shakespeare addressing the problem, how would we be governed as a country if we were governed by a sociopath? In that case, you were thinking of Richard III. Uh, what has happened to change your opinion of that since, if anything? Uh, I think that uh, Shakespeare was on to a set of deep and troubling uh, questions about how, how a society, any society, even one extremely well organized uh, and apparently healthy, uh, becomes ill. Uh, what happens, he wondered, if the leader of the country is, is not fully stable, if he uh, goes mad, as King Lear goes mad, or as Leontes goes mad in The Winter's Tale. What happens if if uh, he gives orders uh, that are clearly immoral and unjust, who stands up to such a person? Uh, and he, throughout uh, his career, he worried deeply about this, including worrying, uh, thinking about would assassination be a way of dealing with, As with we the leader of this in kind? Julius Caesar. In Julius Caesar, and he thought that isn't uh, the way to go about dealing with it catastrophic, potentially catastrophic. Be careful problem. what you wish for. Yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. because you could bring about the very thing that you think you're uh, trying to stop. It seems the one constant is human nature doesn't change. Uh, human nature doesn't change, but institutions change and have greater and lesser degrees of protection against disasters of this kind. And in fact, I think toward the end of his life, Shakespeare gave thought to a strange idea, strange 
in the early 17th century. Uh, what if politics could stop such a person? What if it were possible through uh, elections, mm -hmm. for example, voting, through organizing voters to stop a catastrophe before it happens. Stephen Greenblatt, the book, The Rise and Fall of Adam and Eve, just been published by W.W. W. Norton and reviewed October 8th in the New Sunday New York Times book review. And coming up when we return, my Times colleagues on The Backstory. Welcome back to the New York Times Close Up. What led our news coverage and analysis this week? Like so many others, it was dominated by pronouncements and rants by President Trump. Obamacare survived again. Another tax plan surfaced. A federal appeals panel overturned the convictions of former state senator majority leader Dean Skelos and his son Adam, as it did the verdict before on former Assembly Speaker Sheldon Silver. And who would have thought political football would be so literal? Joining me to discuss these stories and more, my Times colleagues, contributing writers Clyde Haberman and Eleanor Randolph, about New York columnist Jim Dwyer and City Hall Bureau reporter J. David Goodman. Let's talk about that Skelos indictment thrown out after Shelley Silver is thrown out. Does that mean you can do anything you want in Albany or in public office now? It, no, yeah. but it may be, yeah, or yes. <laughs> but it certainly makes it harder to get convictions uh, on it. I mean, this was not a surprise, obviously, after this, uh, the Silver uh, verdict was thrown out. Uh, they'll be retried. Uh, both uh, courts uh, ruled in this case that the evidence is pretty strong against them if only the judge's instructions to the jury were properly worded uh, to keep with the Supreme Court ruling last year against the former Virginia Governor Bob McDonnell. Raises an interesting question of what happens to Roberto uh, uh, Robert Menendez out in, uh, in uh, New Jersey. In that case trial. still going on. And it may be a similar issue of what qualifies as an official act that, that makes it all unkosher, whatever they do. Yeah, it's, it's, it was a good week for, uh, for, for uh, political crooks. And for miscreants. Eleanor, what do they have to do now to prove that someone is actually guilty of uh, well, we misfeasance in office? With the Senator uh, Menendez case, it has to be uh, direct it has to be something that he has control over. And so uh, the pay to play has to be more direct. You know, you have to actually pay uh, uh, or, or provide, you know, airplanes or women or whatever. And then the uh, politician has to actually be able to do something to affect a change, to make a law, to change a, to, to set up a hearing, to do something like that. What I think is interesting about the Menendez case is that this gives, this ruling gives that judge an outline of how to, uh, to send the, to tell the jury what they have to do. Because in both cases, this was the, the, the judges who had, had, right. had crossed the line, although, of course, they didn't, didn't, they didn't know, know the where line. the line was. They didn't know that the line was going to be there. Well, what happened is the Supreme Court has moved the right. line right. That's right. so that it's a much more tightly constricted group of acts that, that are qualified as official acts that, for which you can get insurable bribery. But, you know, in Albany, they don't play by normal rules, right? It's not as though the legislature functions as a, a normal democratic small d legislature. It's a kind of a banana republic with the three men in a room and they all make a deal among themselves. So is that an official act? I don't know. So is it true more than ever that the problem with Albany is what's legal, not even what's illegal? Yes, it may absolutely. Be, but, but yes, it's again, always the courts, but the court in the Silver case, let's say, was very, very clear that it saw no merit in, in Silver's arguments that uh, he was unfairly convicted and there was no evidence against him. Look. He arranges for state grants to go to a cancer clinic. The cancer guy makes sure that all these, uh, that his patients go to uh, uh, Silver's law firm where he was of counsel. Uh, uh, I see a quid, I see a quo. Uh, I, I think... Uh, and there's a pro in between there. There's, there's, there's a pro and we all should hope that the pro is June Kim, the acting U.S. attorney for this uh, in, district. Indeed. Right. David, we got a mayoral debate uh, coming up, but what should we look for? And more importantly, you've got to cover this campaign. Does it really matter? 
Uh, that's a good, better question. I mean, I do think the debate matters, especially now that um, we have a third person that's going to be in the debate. At well, it may candidate. be more fun. Well, what I mean is that it actually takes a lot of uh, the oomph away from the uh, Republican candidate who was already having a very hard time gaining any kind of traction, seems to be running for some kind of role in Staten Island later by, you know, aligning herself or, or not distancing herself enough from uh, President Trump, who's deeply unpopular in the city. And now she's got to sort of... Among Republicans, the Republicans as well? Uh, well, there's not enough Republicans in the mm -hmm. city. That's the problem. You have about six to one or six and a half to one uh, registration advantage for Democrats. There's conservative Democrats in Staten Island and in Queens, but it's not enough to really put together. And even if it were close to that, if you're getting some votes of people that are, you know, dishap or not happy with uh, uh, the mayor, now you have Bo Deedel, who has the, essentially the same message as Nicole Maliotakis, the GOP candidate, but he's got a kind of more earthy way of delivering it and an ability to attract attention. He's kind of the Donald Trump of this race. Right. Uh, he's a little more, um, he has some background, and he actually was a police officer. Um, and, you know, people sort of give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, but whether he can have the same effect that Donald Trump had on the national stage, I don't, I don't see it. We're not as polarized in the city. And he's running on a um, dump the mayor line, not on a major party line. And the word you were reaching for is crude. Crude. Oh, he's right. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. more than that. I so think, what does the mayor have to do? Just keep his hands in his pockets and his mouth shut? He really doesn't have to lay out a second term plan because he's facing essentially nominal opposition at this point and the polls show he's got a lead of 40 isn't, or 50 points. Over. Isn't he trying to sort of move everything he really wants to do to after the no, November elections? What so does he right. want to do? Well, I mean, I was thinking about the whole commission for these statues. Right, me too. You know, he put that whole thing off, you know, until after November. Uh, and it seems to me that, that you... You know, there doesn't seem to be a, be a real there there, you mm -hmm. know. We well, staked out big fights, but all the big fights he'll have are in Albany and will happen next year on, right. you know, the trying to get more money from the MTA through a tax that is, stands not a lot of chance of passing up there. Uh, you mentioned tax. the statues again, like that's not going to happen until after the election. Uh, right. He's plus, got a lot of, mm -hmm. plus he's made clear that he's going to keep traveling the country as sort of Mr. Progressive America. And we'll see how well that plays by in a city that likes its mayors to stick a a little closer to home. His Speak. big challenge, I was going to say his big challenge now, if he gets elected a second term as a Democrat for the first time in decades, is can he be the first mayor in memory to go on to something else after he leaves office? Or well, not only Not memory, even memory. It's not yeah. since the 1860s. <laughs> That's right. Even, even uh, at this end of the table, we don't remember that. <laughs> and no mayor of consolidated uh, New York has ever done that. In fact, uh, it, talk about dead ends. Uh, talk about uh, mass transit for a moment in the MTA. Uh, there's a lot of argument going back and forth between the mayor and the governor. Has anyone sat down and said, what does the MTA actually need to get the system going again, uh, as it did back in the mid-70s under Dick Ravitch, when they said, look, this may not be realis realistic, we may not be able to get it, but frankly, this is what we need in order to rebuild the system? I think you've had a lot of different plans. I mean, Loda laid out a plan that, um, you know, would do a sort of short-term fix, and they, you know, the governor's already said he thinks it's working. I don't know if people that ride the subway all the time have really seen that yet. But the longer-term thing is to really update the signal so that you can get more trains to run on the tracks and therefore reduce the congestion. Because ironically, they actually, and we did a great investigative story on this, you know, they run, um, they actually cancel trains because they're too crowded, thereby increasing the amount of crowds on the next trains, and it's like a kind of a snowball effect, and so they need to address that. That's a long-term fix. We have, even on lines where they're trying to update the signals, like the 7 line, it hasn't come on as fast as they thought it was going to. So that's a real issue. They need to put more money into it. They need to have better contracts where they're not spending, overspending on, you know, uh, the amount of sort of rail miles that they're putting in place. And, you know, they have a lot of issues that they haven't fully figured out. At least that's my Including feeling. the money. I mean, there's still no clear indication of, you know, this $800 million that Loda asked for in this thing. And uh, uh, the governor immediately said, okay, I'll, I'll put up half of it. And the mayor's resisted, saying the state has more than enough. Um, it's two months later since we heard that. And, you know, where's the dough? Where's the dough and where's the constituency? Uh, I don't see the leadership on anybody's part, frankly, when it comes to mass transit, which is vital for this city. Yeah. Well, interestingly, the governor has been has had his hands deep into the transit MTA more so than ever. More so than ever, and actually, even before we knew it, he was in there and he drove the Second Avenue subway opening. Uh, some say, you know, prematurely because there were certain things that were unfinished. But the real question, I think, is not. I mean, where is the leadership? You're right. The assembly didn't have a single hearing last year on transportation, or I think the year before. What kind of oversight are they providing? The signals, I mean, not forget just the signals. The ridership was climbing. 
and the re mechanical reliability was declining. So it's a formula for a disaster, but where are the elected officials? The public knew this every time we got on the subways. You could see trains were too crowded or they were coming too slow. And uh, the, I think the, the state legislature really fell down on the job. And no one is holding them accountable. I, I mean, I just don't see that, and I don't understand it when everyone practically rides mass transit, and we are so dependent on but it, and nobody is you know, standing forward. Mm -hmm. well, well, you know, yes, apparently I, I so. I, I sort At of least the mayor went to the High Line, though. <laughs> yeah, finally. <laughs> no and trains on there, though, anymore. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's right. No but, you know, I think, I think uh, that Cuomo has actually taken more control over the MTA. I mean... We, you know, we spent years trying to say, to to make him say, okay, it's mine, it's my MTA, it's not the mayor's, because people who live in New York City think the mayor runs the MTA, and he doesn't really. the The governor does, so he 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 sort of celebrated the Second Avenue subway, and when he, as soon as he did, you could see the the blame or the control or the responsibility all landed right on him, and so. Except you know, he's the one who's going to have to right. have to ha have to manage this going forward. But, but has he? No, because well, he was going to have to. He was fine for the ribbon cutting, uh, the Second Avenue subway. But uh, as soon as the problems mounted this uh, summer of hell, uh, once Joe Loda came on board, the first thing they did was uh, haul out ancient memos on how, in fact, the subways are owned by the city, and so it's all on the mayor when it has no practical uh, sense whatsoever. It is a state agency, we all know that. But it was a little disheartening that their first instinct was to say, hey, it ain't on me, it's on him. That's right, Too and late. it's certainly a regional problem and the rest of the state depends on it. Well, for a sure. decade ago, there was a big crisis in transit. We always have one every decade or so. And <laughs> there was a commission that set up, it came up with what was called a grand bargain. Every other year, there would be a fare increase, mm -hmm. not above the inflation rate. And there would be certain dedicated taxes. Well, the fare increases have come along, but the dedicated taxes have not. And so that is the crux of the economic crisis, particularly when you had a big downturn, as we did in 2008, and for a couple of years after that. Now you have a booming city. We came out, New York came out of the uh, recession faster than any other place in the country. We have more jobs going right now, and more people riding the trains. Thanks to Shelley Silver, we don't have a commuter tax, of course. David, is there any chance we will get a congestion pricing formula or come up with a new name for congestion pricing so it becomes more palatable? Right. I mean, uh, well, not right now. I mean, the mayor has not been supportive of it. There is no plan in Albany for it, which is what he likes to say. Um, you know, the governor has expressed support, but it seemed like only to needle the mayor because he knew the mayor wasn't uh, on board Why not? With it. Or uh, maybe it's not a good idea, is it? You know, I think the mayor has been a little disingenuous on this. He talks about how it's essentially a regressive tax, um, you know, not sort of pointing out that every toll is, is like that. And so he says, you know, that essentially uh, low-income New Yorkers shouldn't be made to pay to come into the central city when, you know, the poorest New Yorkers ride the train and they pay the exact same fare as everyone else. So, you know, he's, there is a plan that, um, you know, Move New York plan that sort of addresses trying to adjust the other tolls around the city to make everything more fair. But... Uh, he hasn't gotten behind that, and he's sort of pushing it back onto Cuomo, saying, well, give me a plan, then we'll see. It's a lot easier now than it was when Bloomberg had the idea, because now you don't need to have toll booths. Right. You right. just That's drive right. right through. That's right. Thanks to my Times colleagues, Clyde Haberman, Eleanor Randolph, Jim Dwyer, and J. David Goodman for joining us, and some final thoughts to follow. In 1979, when radical students seized the American embassy in Tehran, New York officials faced a quandary. Kennedy Airport was a global gateway, but few New Yorkers would defend flying the Iranian flag in the International Arrivals Building. One ingenious executive, Sid Fergand, improvised a diplomatic solution. He sent all the foreign flags out to the cleaners. When it comes to race in America, we pretty much do the same thing sweep it under the rug, focus on symbols instead of substance. Once again, the national anthem has become a protest symbol by athletes, some of whose colleagues wear the flag on their uniforms in violation of the U.S. flag code. Speaking of flag etiquette, the Star Spangled Banner was inspired by the flag that flew over Fort Sumter during the War of 1812. After the war, that flag was supposedly cut 
into strips as souvenirs by the fort's commander. And let's not forget who wrote the Pledge of Allegiance, a Baptist minister from New York who preached that Jesus was a socialist. It was originally recited with right arm outstretched until World War II. Back to the anthem, whom did Key include in the land of the free? What did he mean when in the third stanza that slaves who fought for their freedom with the British would find no refuge from the terror of flight or the gloom of the grave? Congress rejected the Star Spangled Banner in dozens of votes. Professors at Teachers College called it warlike. The New York Herald Tribune complained that it had words that nobody can rem remember to a tune that nobody can sing. Even prohibitionists recoiled because the tune originated in a 19th century British drinking song. Maybe they were on to something. The song's chief congressional sponsor was later credited with repealing prohibition. Finally, in 1931, the Star Spangled Banner was named the national anthem, thanks to a dogged Baltimore congressman. In a letter to the Times that resonates today, a New York lawyer allowed as how the congressman had lobbied for the song because it celebrated, quote, a minor incident in the War of 1812 of no great importance in national history, which had taken place in his own state. People feel that way about their own little affairs, the New York lawyer wrote, but can't the nation have some sense of proportion? Sending a message about how you feel can be expressed by waving a flag or removing one, by saluting or by kneeling. The First Amendment guarantees the right to speak, also the right, though not the obligation, to listen. In 1964, a civil rights worker from New York named Michael Schwerner gave his life for what he felt. He stood with a gun to his chest in a Mississippi barn as a Klansman demanded, are you that end lover? Sir, Schwerner replied seconds before he was shot, I understand how you feel. For the New York Times and CUNY TV, I'm Sam Roberts.